Welcome back to my series, Dance Moms Uncovered. XOMG Pop started as a kids' pop group of seven young girls aged between 10 and 14. At first it seemed harmless enough, until girls began disappearing and the allegations against the sea was began to build. As someone who has watched hours upon hours of JoJo's interviews and content in order to make a JoJo Siwa documentary last year, I feel like I should have seen this coming. There were so many red flags that things weren't right within this group, and I'm ready to take you on a very deep dive. Because there was much more to XOMG Pop than Jess and JoJo cared to show. Feel free to share your thoughts on the following evidence. First, let's look at Jess's management. If you watch Siwa's Dance Pop Revolution for even a minute, it becomes glaringly obvious that XOMG Pop was a vanity project for Jess. She seems determined to prove to the world that she can make more stars than just her daughter. She also seems to thrive off the praises and worship of these young children and their mothers. Just look at how the series starts with Jess and Jojo peering down at everyone else. It's like they need everyone to know that they're the ones with the power, that they're the ones in charge. In an interview promoting the show, Jess declared that she sees the XOMG pop girls like her daughters. This is especially concerning given the way that she treated her own daughter in the pursuit of stardom. When Jojo was asked about the best advice she had received from her mum, she told a story about her first ever live performance. Before the show, she was freaking out and full of nerves, so Jess kicked everyone out of the room and told her to knock it off. Jojo has also explained that her mum will tell her when she's performing badly and will sit up in the sound booth with her arms crossed. Even recently, when Jojo did her own thing and signed up for Special Forces last year, Jess was so mad that she gave Jojo the silent treatment. I just feel like they're all my new daughters. Jojo, what is the best piece of advice you've ever received from your mom? It was my first ever live performance and I was very, very nervous. And my mom came in the trailer with me and locked everybody else out and very much so told me to knock it off. <laughs> no one in that audience gives one crap if I'm tired. And especially my mom watching me with her folded arms in the <laughs> sound booth. Because if I am out of breath, she will tell me. And if I look bad, she will tell me. I start sobbing because oh I thought my mom was going to be furious. And if you know my mom, it doesn't take much to get her furious. <laughs> My mom did not want me no to do the show at all. No. We didn't actually talk for a minute. Like, my mom was pretty, pretty upset about me. When we were talking, I was just annoyed because yeah. I didn't want you to do it. It was for like your own safety. Only talking if we, like, had to. Yeah. But there was no, like, fun mom-daughter chit-chat anymore. Yeah. It was like, no. she was mad at me. And if she can treat her own child like this, what hope did the XOMG pop girls have? Jess seems proud of the fact that she never coddles kids and believes in tough love. Jojo has explained that her mom has a short fuse. And she would know this better than anyone. She's been her target for years. She and Jojo have actually frequently drawn comparisons between her teaching style and Abby Lee Miller's teaching. Well, my mom's never been the mom that has coddled me. <laughs> She's never babied me, I guess I should say. My mom trained me and like raised me to be that same way. Like I never was allowed to be like, mm, my knee hurts. Yeah. It was like, no, your knee is fine. That is just how the dance world is. Like, that's how all my teachers have been growing up. I went to Dance Moms when I was 11, so I had 10 years of dance before going to Dance Moms. I started when I was very, very young. And my mom was my dance teacher for most of my life. So how did Jess treat the XOMG pop girls? According to the Rolling Stone article, she would be verbally abusive, calling them names, and even shaming one of the girls, Sadie O'Sullivan, for having a disability. Several people on set alleged that Jessalyn berated the girl, mocking her for the way that she moved her limbs and mimicking the way that she spoke. Angie says that Jessalyn used to tell the mums all the time that they need to yell at their kids and tell them what they're doing wrong. Jess would go, you, you moms, you better go yell at your kid and tell them what they're yeah. doing wrong. Jess revealed that she calls the XOMG girls her dolls. Perhaps this is why she's allegedly been so cruel to kids who didn't fit her vision. Maybe she should stop treating them like little objects for her to show off, and more like the young, impressionable human beings that they are, who deserve to be treated with patience and understanding in their developmental years. Next, let's explore Jojo's teaching. Just because Jojo grew up as the subject of her mother's management, she is not absolved of the mistreatment that she has allegedly shown to the XOMG kids. 
According to the Rolling Stone article, Jojo was sometimes nasty and domineering to them. They say that she would scream insults at the girls, play favourites, and pit members against each other. She was accused of shouting at the girls in their headsets during a performance at the Mall of America, telling them that they sucked, and declaring that they aren't performing well enough. Jojo herself has admitted that she will straight up tell the kids that their routines are awful, and will make them start over. And Leah says that Jojo would make the girls rehearse routines one at a time, and everyone else was forced to watch and criticize the one who was performing. I would straight up be like, that was awful from the top. Yeah. <laughs> she would make us go one at a time, doing all of the dances, and then like make our peers critique us, but it wasn't like constructive criticism. It was just mean things that were being said and she was making people say about each other. It also seems that Jojo expects these young children, most of whom were younger than she was during her Nickelodeon days, display the same amount of dedication to the point of harm. She explains that once she performed a concert even though she could barely move due to illness. She was crying both before and after the show and had to be carried back to her dressing room at the end of the night. After telling this story, Jojo declares that she teaches the XOMG girls to push through pain and discomfort just like she did. I literally was like, couldn't see out of my eyes, my throat was closed, my arms were cold and like shaky and it's you like couldn't touch no me because I was so sensitive. Yeah. Crying on the floor. I didn't feel anything for an hour and a half. You kind of go into a different world. Came off stage and I literally, Ezra had to carry me back to the dressing room. I couldn't move. I couldn't oh. talk. I was crying. But you would have never have known. No, you got like, idea what That's happened. what I tell my girl group now too is I'm like, sometimes you just have to put your big girl panties on and fake it. <laughs> Like oh, fake it we did this shoot always. here and it was freezing and they were cold and they were all sick and like it was an awful shoot and they're all just standing outside so cold and I was like, you guys, I know it sucks. In an interview, Kinley revealed that Jojo even makes the girls do stamina training every single day to push their limits. And what did stamina training look like? Apparently during rehearsals, the girls were forced to wear sweatshirts and sweatpants and Jojo would crank the heat up in the studio as high as possible. It was particularly dangerous for Leah, since she was taking a lot of medication at the time. The kids were often on the verge of passing out and had to run outside the studio to cool off and breathe. This kind of training is something that Jojo brags about doing herself, but that's different because she's an adult and has a choice, whereas these kids don't seem to have that same choice. We literally kids and like with my disability, like I take a lot of medicine and so being like in an overheating environment like obviously that's not good for me and so we had to wear sweatshirts and sweatpants multiple layers with the heat all the way up dancing full out we literally just and go singing. over and over and singing over and over and over to the point where we'd be almost passing out we would literally have to run outside to like breathe then there's the concerning fact that jojo has strong connections and friendships with people who have been accused of abusing and being predatory towards children like Colleen Ballinger, James Charles, Abby Lee Miller, and Shane Dawson. The XOMG girls have spent time with these individuals, and even performed at one of Colleen's shows. She doesn't seem to realize that just because people haven't directly hurt her, it doesn't mean that they're safe for children to be around. What's really scary is that Jojo says she wants kids in the near future. She already has incredibly high expectations for these hypothetical kids too, saying that if they enjoy soccer, she wants them to make it to the World Cup or if they enjoy gymnastics, they're going to the Olympics. It also speaks volumes that during week four of Siwa's dance pop revolution, she was very impressed with a kid who kept rehearsing when all the other kids were busy playing with one another. She gave this child a special part as a reward. Just because Jojo was constantly busy and has been jumping from one project to the next all her life, doesn't mean that the kids around her should have to experience the same thing. What activities would you try to enroll them in? Okay. They can pick whatever of they course. want. If we're playing with soccer balls when we're four, we are going to the World Cup. <laughs> if we decide we're a gymnast at age four, no changing to dance. We're sticking with gymnastics and we're going to the Olympics. It was week four and one of the little kids was in one room by herself practicing and the other kids were on a couch just like hanging out. I was like, you gotta start front and center because I saw you were working and they all were playing. <laughs> Evidence number three, the power imbalance. There are extreme imbalances of power at play in the formation and management of XOMG Pop. 
In an interview, the original XOMG pop girls declared that they all attended JoJo's concerts when they were younger and looked up to JoJo. It should go without saying that employing your fans creates an extreme power imbalance where you are idolized and people feel like they can't say no to you. For instance, Leah says that Kinley was made to always wear pigtails and scrunchies, even though she told the Seawiz that she didn't want to wear them anymore. We've all been to JoJo's concerts before this when we were little. Kinley didn't, as she got a little older, I can think I can speak for them and say she didn't want to wear those pigtails every single day. And tried to and voice it. She always had those pigtails and, you know... <laughs> the scrunchies on her ankles and yeah. when other people did have a little more lay leeway I feel like she didn't have as much leeway. Leah's mum Angie describes the culture saying you're kind of taught from the beginning you need to act grateful and thankful at all times and thank Jojo and Jess for every little thing. In every single interview of the group that I've watched the girls are thanking Jess and Jojo profusely over and over for everything. It's not unusual to thank people for launching your career, I suppose, but it's strange that they're not discussing their own talent and instead discussing the so-called generosity of Jess and Jojo over and over. Several people on the set of Siwa's Dance Pop Revolution claimed that the producers would tell one another, it's not a good day unless you make a kid cry. Others claimed that the kids would come home and have a candy basket and Nintendo Switch in their hotel room after being messed with all day. A representative from the production company denied that children were given gifts, even though there is pictorial evidence of Kaya receiving a gift basket. It's been clear from the get-go that the girls didn't believe that they were deserving of this investment, which is the source of this huge power imbalance. As an outsider, I suspect that Jess and Jojo use gifts as a mean to placate the mums and dismiss the criticism of the kids. Sort of an attitude of, who cares if I tormented you on set for weeks at a time? I gave you an extravagant, expensive gift basket. Jess and Jojo haven't seemed to stop with the over-the-top gifts either. They even gave Brooklyn a dog. Considering the allegations that the Seawiz weren't paying the girls fairly, buying Brooklyn a dog was a comparatively cheap way of gaining her favour. It's been alleged that after Kaya was fired from the group, the other members were made to believe that their position in the group was never guaranteed. Angie says she was in constant fear of speaking against Jess or Jojo, worrying that her daughter would be kicked out of the group or that she would be sued for breaching her contract. Two individuals associated with Siwa's Dance Pop Revolution claimed that the mums were threatened with legal action on multiple occasions. Kinley's recent music video Heartbeats has several nods to her time in XOMG Pop. Her rainbow costume, her clown makeup with rhinestones, the street where Studio Siwa is located, and you can hear a voice at the beginning of the video saying, where are you going? You're nothing without me, and you'll be back. There is also a sign saying, if you leave, you may not re-enter. Whether or not these are direct quotes from the Seawiz, there was likely a general understanding within the group that if they left, they would be ostracized forever. Jess and Jojo have refused to acknowledge the departure of any of the four girls who have left. The closest Jojo has come to admitting that there were issues is when she said she was working out some kinks with XOMG Pop, which is an understatement given that only three members remained at the time. We've revamped the group, we've figured out some kinks, some things that work, some things that don't. How many of those of girls are still left? So we right now have three. Four, working conditions. Leah and Angie shared their calendar with Rolling Stone, showing them how filming music videos could take up to nine hours a day which is the maximum number of hours that these children can film in California while school is in session. Leah claims, however, that the girls would often not do their schoolwork on days like these and quickly fell behind. She says that she only logged 6.6 .6 hours of school for the whole month of December 2022, even though they were supposed to do three hours of school for each full day of work. It's not surprising that the Seawiz wouldn't prioritize schooling, especially since Jess took her own son out of school in his junior year to move him to California to do social media with her and Jojo. Speaking of social media, according to Leah, the XOMG pop members were required to put in endless hours making Snapchat, TikTok and YouTube content. She claims that they weren't paid for this work, but instead were bribed with a $500 prize if their TikTok got the most views in a given week. The demanding schedule that the girls had to work seems to mirror Jojo's work hours. She has claimed that she and her mum tend to work late into the night, even when one of them doesn't feel like doing it. And then when it was like my son's junior year, I was like, you're missing everything. 
everything. Like we were traveling the world and he's just like going to high school every day. <laughs> we're putting the hammer down. You're done. You can leave a semester. You can leave now. And he was like, I'll finish a semester. And then they all moved to LA. Um, and we tend to overwork. So, you know, we'll work at night. We'll talk about work when somebody necessarily doesn't want to. Apparently there were issues with receiving proper financial compensation for all of this work. Angie claims that the mums were made to pay for food and transportation, often without being reimbursed. She says that she and Bella's mum began working for Jess, organising Jojo's closet and scrubbing her toilets for $20 an hour just to make ends meet. But even though the Seawiz had rented out a house where the XOMG girls would film their social media content, no one was allowed to stay there. Angie admits that for many months, she and Leah were forced to sleep on blow-up mattresses on the floor of Kinley's dance studio. She explained further in a live stream that their contracts stated that transport and accommodation would be provided for them while they're working. And they weren't the only ones living like this either. Bella and Carrie also lived with Kinley's family on their fold-out couch, and Brooklyn and Cece were staying with Dallas and her family. She has since added that some of the families were even on food stamps because all the mothers had to quit their jobs. The contracts also said that while we were working, that travel and accommodations would be provided. Cece and Brooklyn didn't live there. I believe they were staying with Kristen in Dallas. She had a, an extra living room with a fold out couch and that's where Bella um, in her mom's state. They claim that they never made any money creating social media content, doing brand deals, doing individual music videos, photo shoots, rehearsals, or merchandising. Angie posted to her Instagram story a screenshot of a chat with Jess, where Jess seems to tell her that legally, she didn't need to pay them because she gave them $17,000 in gifts over the two years that they worked together. Angie provided Rolling Stone with a record contract in which the girls were promised $10,000 for their first album. She says that ultimately they received a little over $4,000 because Jess claimed that she had to pay for the Airbnb that they lived in after spending a year living with Kinley. And each girl was only promised 2.8% of the merchandising revenue. And finally, we have disregarding health concerns. It seems that the Seawiz didn't prioritise the health of the XOMG girls from the get-go. During rehearsals one day, Leah says that she was bleeding through her belly button. Rather than being encouraged to take a break, Jess apparently told her to cover it with a maxi pad to stop it from leaking onto her costume. Angie and Leah revealed that during rehearsals for the Mall of America performance, Jojo was threatening to fire Dallas, who was struggling to breathe due to a medical condition, which was made worse by the cold Michigan air. Dallas was crying and the mums were pleading to let her stay. Meanwhile, Leah, who was sick at the time, was throwing up backstage. It was 10 o'clock at night when they were rehearsing and Leah had to be carried back to the dressing room. Apparently, another kid was even throwing up the next day and yet they all still performed. I was so sick, like I could barely walk. Everybody knew this. One of the other girls was also having some medical issues at the same time. Dallas, you can say. Okay, her name. Dallas. She was really struggling to breathe. The Minnesota air is hard, I guess, if you have like lung issues. It was so uh -huh. cold. And she'd been to the doctor already. The I'm, moms are like, please, Jess, please talk to JoJo, because JoJo was the one not wanting to do JoJo it. was the one that was trying to just kick her out of the whole group. And then at the same You're time. You're puking. I'm puking. Dallas can't, can't breathe. breathe. I, um, <laughs> it's, it's late, late at night. It's, it's late like at night. And then 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> my dad had to carry me to the room because that's how bad like I was feeling. One girl actually puked backstage like right before we went on. Uh -huh. Leah also alleges that she was encouraged by Jess to attend a music video shoot just weeks after she had spinal cord surgery. In one of XOMG's early interviews, Leah says that Jess and Jojo love the fact that she is a fighter and doesn't let her disability hold her back. Well, it seems that even though they love to show off the fact that their group was inclusive of a girl with disabilities, when it came to the practicality of working around those disabilities, they had no patience. You know, my disability doesn't hold me back in that I'm a fighter and I'm really strong and I think Jojo and Jess like really like that for me. I do, we I both that. do. Angie says that even though Leah was only cleared for light physical activity, Jess told her to head back to rehearsals three and a half weeks after surgery. And Leah isn't the only one who was forced back to work quickly after a surgery. Late last year, the newest member of XOMG Pop, Penelope, had appendicitis and an ear infection. 
just 13 days after receiving surgery to remove her appendix, Penelope was back on set filming the music video Santa. Even though the video had less dancing than usual, she was still working and jumping around. This is especially concerning in light of Leah's claim that the girls would film for up to nine hours, which would be way too long for a kid to work less than two weeks after having surgery. So what do you guys think? I personally believe that XOMG Pop was doomed from the start, because children should never have the workload of an adult, even in the entertainment industry. If something isn't done soon, these kids are going to get totally exhausted and burnt out. Let me know what you think about this situation in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.